Hello everyone, I'm Auntie Kara, but this video is not for kids. This is another rendition of book reviews for grown-ups who love fairy tales. Today we are going to be reviewing and reading from the Magician series by Lev Grossman. Um, this series is a trilogy. Uh, this is the first one, The Magicians. The second one is called The Magician King, and the third one is called The Magician's Land. Um, and the books... I am a little conflicted about them, and I will get into that a little bit more later. Um, but first, I just wanted to say that overall, I really enjoyed the series, and it's just so magical. Like, think if Narnia and Harry Potter got put together and added drugs and sex and alcohol and partying teenagers and young adults and stuff like that. Um, so it is definitely an adult book. <laughs> Don't let your children read this. Do not recommend. No. <laughs> but for us grown-ups, it's really, really fun. Um, and there's a lot of really amazing adventure and beauty and wonder, the magic and the the whimsical silliness of it all is really engaging. Um, and the character development that happens and the growth and the transformation uh, is really, really rich and really compelling. And um, in particular, the journey of the character Julia, I really, really love. Like, she is just remarkable and amazing and inspiring. And, and she goes through a lot. Um, I will do a trigger warning of this book does deal with intense violence, including sexual assault. Um, so if that's something that's going to trigger you, please go into it with all your support systems in check, or you might choose not to. Um, that being said, it does propel the story forward. Um, it is definitely a survival, survivor's journey for the character of Julia, and I really love the transformation and the adventure she goes on throughout the novels. Um, however... <laughs> The part that I'm very conflicted about is the character of Quentin, who is the male lead. Um, Julia is the female lead and kind of goes on her own story for a bit, and their story's going to come back together and go apart and come back to together and go apart again. Um, but the character of Quentin is so whiny, <laughs> and he's kind of that character that everything he ever dreams of comes true, and he's still not happy. And it's just one of those things where he spends so much time whining that it makes it really hard to get through the first, the first book. So in the show, you see the storylines of Quentin and Julia happen at the same time. Um, however, in the books, the first book primarily deals with Quentin's journey. And then in the second book, you get Julia's side of things. So because the first book is so heavy on Quentin, I found it really hard to get through. And I've actually recommended the series to friends who weren't able to get past the first book just because of how whiny Quentin is and how annoying it is. Um, but that being said, book two and book three are some of the most amazing and beautiful things I've ever read in my whole life, particularly book three. Um, the writing is so vivid and the, the way the mythology kind of plays out is so engaging. It was definitely one of those ones where I almost cried when it was over uh, because I just wanted the story to keep going. And, you know, it's one of those ones where it paints such a vivid picture in your mind that you almost forget you're reading and you just kind of go into this journey of imagination. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that about these books. And I am going to urge you and encourage you as much as I can to soldier through <laughs> the whininess of Quentin in book one to get to the brilliance of book two and three. And that's not to say that there's not good stuff in the first book. Like there's a lot of really cool imagery around animal transformation and adventures and, and their first trip into the magical realm. And there is a lot of really good stuff in there, but you just kind of want to shake Quentin <laughs> and be like, if I had your life, I would be so thrilled. But he just, he's never happy. And he's one of those people that are never happy. And I think you just, when you're reading this series, you just have to understand that. And you just have to 
kind of meet him in his misery and realize that he's never going to change. You know, we all know these people. Um, so with that said, I am going to read to you quite a few passages from here because there's just so much good stuff. Um, I'm going to read to you two shorter sections and one longer section. So let's dive into the magicians. As he walked, Quentin unwound the little red threaded clasp that held shut the manila envelope. He saw immediately immediately that it wasn't his transcript or an official document of any kind. The envelope held a notebook. It was old looking, its corners squashed and rubbed till they were smooth and round, its cover, its cover foxed. The first page, handwritten in ink, read The Magicians, Book Six of Fillery and Further. The ink had gone brown with age. The Magicians was not the name of any book Christopher Plover of any book by Christopher Plover that Quentin knew of, and any good nerd knew that there were only five books in the Fillory series. When he turned the page, a piece of white note paper folded over once, flew out, and slipped away on the wind. It clung to the wrought iron area fence for a second before the wind whipped it away again. There was a com community garden on the block, a triangular snippet of land too narrow and weirdly shaped to be snapped up by the de developers. With its ownership a black hole of legal ambiguity, ambiguity, it had been taken over years ago by a collective of enterprising neighbors who had trucked out the acid sand native to Brooklyn and replaced it with rich, fertile loam from upstate. For a while, they'd raised pumpkins and tomatoes and spring bulbs and raked out little Japanese serenity gardens, but lately they had neglected it and hardy wood urban weeds had taken root instead. They were running riot and strangling their frailer, more exotic, exotic competitors. It was into this tangled thicket that the note flew and disappeared. This late in the year, all the plants were dead or dying, even the weeds, and Quentin waded into them, hip deep, dry stems catching on his pants, his leather shoes crunching brown broken glass, it crossed his mind that the note might just possibly contain the hot paramedic's phone number. The garden was narrow, but it went surprisingly far back. There were three or four sizable trees in it. The farther in he pushed, the darker and more overgrown it got. He caught a glimpse of the note up high, plastered against a trellis, and crusted it with dead vines. It could clear the back fence before he caught up with it. His phone rang, his dad. Quinton ignored it. Out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw something flip past behind the bracken, large and pale, but when he turned his head, it was gone. He pushed past the corpses of gladolias, petunias, shoulder-high sunflowers, rose bushes, brittle stiff stems, and flowers frozen in death into ornate to toil patterns. He would have thought he'd gone all the way through to 7th Avenue by now. He shoved his way even deeper in, brushing up against... Who knew what toxic flora? In case of poison fucking ivy, that's all he needed now. It was odd to see that here and there among the dead plants, a few vital green stalks still poked up, drawing sustenance from who knew, knew where. He caught a whiff of something sweet in the air. He stopped. All of a sudden it was quiet. No car horns, no stereos, no sirens. His phone had stopped ringing. It was bitter cold, and his fingers were numb. Turn back or go on. He squeezed farther in through a hedge, closing his eyes and squinching up his face against the scratchy twigs. He stumbled over something, an old stone. He felt suddenly nauseous. He was sweating. When he opened his eyes again, he was standing on the edge of a huge, wide, perfectly level green lawn surrounded by trees. The smell of ripe grass was overpowering. There was hot sun on his face. The sun was at the wrong angle. And where the hell were the clouds? The sky was blinding blue. His inner ear spun sickeningly. He held his breath for a few seconds, then expelled freezing winter air from his lungs and breathed in warm summer air in its place. It was thick with floating pollen. He sneezed. In the middle distance beyond the wide lawn, a large house stood, all honey-colored stone and gray slate adorned with chimneys and gables and towers and roofs and subroofs. 
In the center over the main house was a tall and stately clock tower that struck even Quinton as an odd addition to what otherwise looked like a private residence. The clock was in the Venetian style, a single barbed hand circling a face with 24 hours marked on it in Roman numerals. Over one wing rose what looked like the green oxide copper dome of an observatory. Between house and lawn was a series of inviting landscape terraces and spinneys and hedges and fountains. Quentin was pretty sure that if he stood still for a few seconds, everything would snap back to normal. He wondered if he was undergoing some dire neurological event. He looked cautiously back over his shoulder. There was no sign of the garden behind him, just some big leafy oak trees. The advance the advance guard of, wit, of what looked like a pretty serious forest. A rill of sweat ran down his ribcage from his left armpit. It was hot. Quinton dropped his bag on the turf and shrugged out of his overcoat. A bird chirped languid, languidly in the silence. Fifty feet away, a tall, skinny teenager was leaning against a tree, smoking a cigarette and watching him. He looked about Quinton's age. He wore a button-down shirt with sharp collar and very thin, very pale pink stripes. He didn't look, Quint look at Quinton, just dragged on his cigarette and exhaled into the summer air. The heat didn't seem to bother him. Hey, Quinton called. Now he looked over. He raised his chin at Quinton once, but didn't answer. Quinton walked over as nonchalantly as he could. He really didn't want to go to look like somebody who had no idea what was going on. Even without his coat on, he was sweating like a bastard. He felt like an overdressed English explorer trying to impress a skeptical tropical native. But there was something he had to ask. Is this... Quinton cleared his throat. So is this Fillory? He squinted against the bright sun. The young man looked at Quinton very seriously. He took another long drag on his cigarette, then he shook his head slowly, blowing out the smoke. Nope, he said. Upstate New York. <laughs> So that was the long one. Um, and this next one is shorter, but it tells you a little bit more background information about what Fillory is. Christopher Clover's Fillory and Further is a series of five novels published in England in the 1930s. They describe the adventures of the five Chapman children in a magical land that they discovered while on holiday in the countryside with their eccentric aunt and uncle. They aren't really on holiday, of course. Their father is up to his hips in mud and blood at Passchendaele, and their mother has been hospitalized with a mysterious illness that is probably psychological in nature, which is why they've been hastily packed off to the country for safekeeping. But all that unhappiness takes place far in the background. In the foreground, every summer for three years, the children leave their various boarding schools and return to Cornwall, and each time they do, they find their way into the secret world of Fillory, where they have, have, where they have adventures and explore magical lands and defend the gentle creatures who live there against the various forces that menace them. The strangest and most persistent of those enemies is a veiled figure known only as the Watcher Woman, whose horological enchantments threaten to stall time itself, trapping all of Fillory at five o'clock on a particularly dreary, drizzly afternoon in late September. Unlike most people, Quentin read the Fillory books in grade school. Unlike most people, unlike James and Julia, he never got over them. They were where he went when he couldn't deal with the real world, which was a lot. The Fillory books were both a consolation for Julia, not loving him, and also probably a major reason why she didn't. And it was true, there was a strong whiff of the English nursery about them, and he felt secretly embarrassed when he got to the parts about the cozy horse, an enormous, affectionate, equine creature who trots around Fillory by night on velvet hooves, and whose back is so broad you can sleep on it. But there was a more seductive, more dangerous truth to Fillory that Quentin couldn't let go of. It was almost like the Fillory books, especially the first one, The World in the Walls, were about reading itself. When the oldest Chatwin, Melly Cullen Martin, opens the cabinet of the grandfather clock that stands in the dark, narrow back hallway of his aunt's house and slips through into Fillory, Quentin always pictured him awkwardly pushing aside the pendulum like the uvula of monstrous throat. It's like he's opening the covers of a book, but a book that did 
what books always promise to do and never actually quite did get you out, really out of where you were and into somewhere better. The world Martin discovers in the walls of his aunt's house is a world of magical twilight, an escape as black and white and stark as a printed page with prickly, subtle fields and rolling hills crisscrossed by old stone walls. In Fillory, there's an eclipse every day at noon and seasons can last for a hundred years. Bear trees scratch at the sky, pale green seas lap at narrow white beaches made of broken shells. In Fillory, things mattered in a way they didn't in this world. In Fillory, you felt the appropriate emotions when things happened. Happiness was a real, actual, achievable possibility. It came when you called. Or no, it never left you in the first place. I just love that. And there's so much magic in this book. All right, so the next one is pretty quick, and you'll see what it's about. To the one side of the path was a small spreading oak. Its spark was dark gray, almost black, and its branches were gnarled and wiggly and all but empty of leaves. Embedded in its trunk at the head of at head height, as if the tree had simply grown up around it, was a round ticking clock face a foot across. One by one, without speaking, they all scrambled up the slope bank to get a closer look. It was one of the watcher woman's clock trees. Quinton touched the place where the tree's hard, rough bark met the smooth, silver bezel around the clock's face. It was solid and cold and real. He closed his eyes and followed the curve of it with his fingers. He was really here. He was in Fillory. There was no question about it now. And now that he was here, it would finally be all right. He didn't see how yet, but it would. It had to be. Maybe it was the lack of sleep, but hot tears poured helplessly down his cheeks, leaving cold tracks behind them. Against all his own wishes and instincts, he got down on his knees and put his head in his hands and pushed his face into the cold leaves. A sob clawed its way out of him. For a minute, he lost himself. Somebody, he would never know who, not Alice, put their hand on his shoulder. This was the place. He would be picked up, cleaned off, and made to feel safe and happy and whole again here. How had everything gone so wrong? How could he and Alice have been so stupid? He bar It barely even mattered now. This was his life now, the life he had always been waiting for. It was finally here. And it flashed into his head with sudden urgency. Richard was right. They had to find Martin Chatwin if he was somehow still alive. That was the key. Now that he was here, he wasn't going to give it up again. He must know the secret of how to stay here forever, make it last, make it permanent. Quinton got to his feet, embarrassed and blotted his tears on his sleeve. Welp, Josh said, finally breaking the si silence. I guess that pretty much tears it. We're in Fillory. All right, so that's all I'm going to give you. I highly recommend picking up this series. It is an excellent read, despite how whiny Quentin is. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed the reading and my review. And if you love it, if you've read it, if you hate it, please give me some comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see you next time for another review. Ta-ta for now.